Good morning, everybody. In case you were curious, that was Blair yelling back there, not me. <laughs> Although I am excited to have the kids with us next month. See, that's her. Hey, if you have your Bible, open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, many of you probably know this because your kids went and participated, but this week our, our students went to Camp Zephyr for the week. They got back on Friday. Listen, I love Camp Zephyr. I remember going there as a kid, and then uh, I got the privilege of going there for about a decade as a youth pastor, and I, I love camp. I'm a huge fan of camp for many, many, many reasons, right? And I think a lot of people, the, the perception of camp for students is it's just a chance to get away and just like goof off and have fun, and you are right. They do, right? But they have a lot of, of time where they spend learning about God's Word. They have a lot of time where they worship Jesus. They, have, they build relationships with one another, which is extremely important for a healthy church. And I think we have to kind of remind ourselves that that's something that we as adults crave and value, even though we may not put our attention to that, right? Sometimes we need breaks from life. Sometimes we need healthy relationships with friends. And sometimes we just have to like cut loose and go play in the mud. I don't know if that's you, uh, but I like to do that. That seems a little weird, right? But at camp, they do that. I, one of my favorite parts about Camp Zephyr is the rec time where they spend about two hours or no, about an hour and a half, something like that, uh, uh, during the day in the heat of the day in South Texas where it's extremely hot and dry. And they play these games where the kids dress up and act crazy, get loud, um, and try to uh, win these really weird games. I don't know how else to explain it. But my favorite game of all is a, is a game that's an oldie but a goodie. It is tug of war, but it's a little different. It's four-way tug of war. So you've got four teams and a big mud pit in the middle. And let me just paint the picture for you about how amazing this is, okay? Because uh, I participated in it, and I've got to watch it, and it's way more fun to watch than it is to participate. So here's what you do. You take your strongest, like heaviest people, and you put them in the back. You know what I'm talking about? Anchor. And then you take your lightest people, and you put them in the front, right? Because... That's what you need to do. And so what we would do is we would take our, our, our senior boys and we would put them in the back. And then we would take our like seventh grade boys, in this case our sixth grade boys, and we'd stick them in the front. And this is great because as, as they would start, the, those boys would dig their heels in and just lean back, right? Like Fat Joe, just lean back. Nobody? Okay. Uh, if you don't know rap from the early 2000s, I don't know how to help you. Um, but they would lean back, and those kids in the front, they're like, they like, they're so excited. They're like, we're going to win this, right? And then as this like starts to go, you can see those kids start to slide towards the mud pit, right? And their faces change. Like, like their reality and expectations aren't matching up because they think they're going to win it all, and they're going to be like dry. And they begin to realize really quick, I'm about to go face first in this mud pit, right? And the cowards always bail out, right? And that's lame. And so they would like see this and they would just let go and jump out of the way. And, and then they, inevitably that team would lose, right? But this was like my favorite game to, to watch because it just, it's fun, right? It's just fun to watch, right? And, and like they're like into it, you know, like and sometimes you would do this game like three, four times. And like the, the kids that never won, every time they'd be like, we're going to get it this time. This time we're going to get it. Let's mi mi max them, mix them, blah, 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 you know, mix them up, right? And they would do that, and it wouldn't do anything. They would still lose every single time. And those kids would come out, like, there's always that one kid that wants to get muddy, you know, like his team won, but they're like, can I jump in anyways? They're like, all right, man, go ahead. And so they just want to, you know, stand there full of mud. And it's like, what a, what a weirdo, right? Uh, that's probably my kid. But anyways, we, it, it's just a lot of fun for me. I love that game. And I do think this, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of analogies. I think sometimes life is, feels like a tug of war. We've been reading through 2 Thessalonians, kind of like examining like what the church is supposed to do in the midst of like, is Jesus coming back? And how should we react whenever life gets hard? Right, right now in our culture, it feels like a tug of war between the church and the rest of everything else that's pulling us away, right? You've got the cost of, of how everything is, like inflation's insane. You've got crazy politics happening on the television that are just ridiculous, right? You, you've got just stuff, like society just seems to be decomposing as we speak. And yet we're trying to not let those things pull us away from our faith and our belief in Jesus and end up in the mud, right? 
And so this is important for us. There's got to be something that we hold on to that allows us to withstand the pulls of everything else. And the Apostle Paul has been writing to the church and he tells them, remember the things that we taught you, right? Paul's words are God's words through him for us. And they're written down in the Bible for us. And Paul says, remember the things that you were taught. Remember these things that you have held on to dearly. And so we left last week telling you like, hey, you need to know why you believe what you believe. You've got to be able to understand those things and you've got to stick close to the church because as the world continues to deteriorate, you've got to be close to those things in order to not end up in the mud. And so the question then is this, what are the things that Paul's talking about? Like, what are these things that Paul wants us to hold on to and remember? And I think you're going to find that in today's passage, we're going to find some things that allow us to dig our heels in and grab a hold tightly to so that we cannot and so we won't fall into this pit of fear or doubt that comes from all the things that are happening around us. And not just like the end times. Like, there are things that we need to hold on to whenever you get a diagnosis that you weren't expecting or you lose your job out of nowhere or you find yourself not, like, not getting the things that you've been wanting for a long, long time. And so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we endure the things around us that try to rob us of our faith and our joy? Are there things that we can focus on and remember? And Paul tells us that. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, here's where we go. Paul says this, He says, we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us, and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. So out of these few verses, I feel like, based off of what's here, there are four things that Paul wants us to remember and to hold on to that are going to help us not just endure the difficulties of life, but are also going to give us joy in the midst of trials and struggles. And they're going to keep us out of this mud pit that is the, what the world's becoming. So first one is this, and Paul says it in the very beginning, is this, is that the first thing that we can hold on to is this, is that, that God loves us. And y'all, I know that's like easy, like sermon stuff right there. Like people preach this all the time. God loves us. And the truth is he does. Paul tells us that God loved us before he He created us. Before time began, he loved us. His love for you and I was there. And that matters. That matters when you feel like, based off of how bad everything is going, that God's not there. Right? Like when stuff starts to stack up and stack up and stack up, and it's hard, most of us begin to go, God, do you even care? Are you even there? Do you love me? Because if you did, I don't think you would allow this, 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 and this to happen. And Paul says, you are brothers and sisters loved by God. So when things don't turn out the way we want, it's important that we remember not only does God love us, but the love of God is actively pursuing you and I. What does that mean? When when, when Paul talks about God loving us, he's talking about this in the context of those who belong to him, children of God. Not every human being in the world is a child of God. Only those who profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are his children. And so when he's talking to the church, he's talking to Christians, he's saying, you, those who have been saved by Jesus, he loves you. And he's loved you from before you were even created. And that's important for us. Because what that tells us is this. is that God's love is actively pursuing you before you were born to save you from your rebellion towards him. We have to remember that when we choose to sin, when we choose to go different from the path that God has for us, however great or small that may be, that is active rebellion against the creator. And God has every right to punish those who are rebellious towards him. I know that seems kind of scary, but this is the truth. And here's why that's important. To know 
That in spite of our rebellion towards God, he's actively chasing us, shows how much he loves us. Like As parents, we grasp and understand this concept. When our kids act a fool and you want to spank them or hit them with a the belt or, or, I don't know, some of y'all put them in time out, whatever you want to do, right? That doesn't work for my kids, right? You, you love them even though you, you got to... You gotta punish them at times, right? And and the kids don't see that, right? Whenever they're in trouble, they're like, "You don't love me. You hate me so much. You took my phone away and you grounded me." And uh, I'm like, be quiet, you know. <laughs> is that just my house? No. But the love of God is there. No matter no matter how much our kids disappoint us, we still want them to know that we love them. We still want them to have a relationship with us, and that's how God is with us. Paul. Paul says this a lot in the scriptures. He even wrote it in Ephesians chapter 2. He says this, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. Like, the love of God is active because he's chasing us down and making us his children. That's a big thing to hold on to. We have to remind ourselves over and over and over and over again that God's love for us is real and it's there, but it's only for those who've trusted in Jesus. And that's another part of the the piece of the puzzle that's going to be kind of hard to chew on, but we have to understand this, that all of those who are rebellious against God deserve the punishment of God for their rebellion, and yet God steps in out of his love and makes a way for us to be forgiven. And he takes the punishment upon his son so that we don't have to. Listen, the, the, the work of God in our life starts long before we're born. Paul says that here. That the love of God began before we were created. And that's important when we look at the next one. And it is this. The second point that I think is important for us to hold on to is this is that when life gets hard, we remind ourselves that God loves us. It's the second point is this, is that we have been chosen by God. Now, listen, this is a controversial controversial topic. But Paul sees this idea of being chosen by God over and over again. And it's a comfort and it's a joy and a blessing. So we need to talk about this. He says in verse 13, From the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification, by the Spirit, and through belief in the truth. So there's a reason why we as a church, uh, we, we make a point to go through books of the Bible verse by verse in chunks so that we have an understanding of it. And the reason for that is so we don't avoid difficult topics and difficult scriptures that are hard for us to kind of chew on. And this is one of those that tends to be really kind of controversial where people fall on different places in the church and they want to ask the question about this. Is being chosen by God to be saved a biblical concept? Because I've been told that that's not. And I'm here to tell you the answer is yes. Yes. I've got proof. In Genesis, there's a story about two brothers named Jacob and Esau. Maybe you know the story well, or maybe you don't, but here's how it goes. Jacob steals his brother Esau's birthright, and eventually he runs away. Yet the Bible tells us in Malachi that God said that he loved Jacob and Esau he hated. That seems weird, right? I thought God's a God of love. How can he hate? Paul knew it. He even quotes this in the book of Romans. What we see here is that God chooses to love Jacob instead of Esau. When we look at the Old Testament, we see this, that God chose the Israelites as his people, not the other way around. He said, I'm going to choose you, and I'm going to choose to love you. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 8. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord had his heart set on you and he chose you, not because you were numerous than all the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. He brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God chose Israel to be his people, not because they were a great nation, but because through that nation, his name would be made great. Like when you choose a great nation as your your people, 
It's easy for the people to go, well, that God's really not that big a deal because look how great we are. And so, go, so God knew and he chose Israel, the lowest of the nations, to make his name great. So it wouldn't be about the Israelites. It would be about him. But yet God chose them. We also see in the Old Testament, as, as we're reading that passage, that God chose Moses to free the people from captivity. I mean, there's lots of stories in the Old Testament that we could point out and show you this, but we can even see this in the New Testament because Jesus picked his disciples one by one, and he even told them in John chapter 15, he said, look, don't, don't get mistaken. He says, don't get it twisted. I chose you. You didn't choose me. That's a paraphrase, but you can find it in John 15. And that's what Jesus told them. And even Paul, when he talks about being chosen by God throughout the New Testament, we see him talking about this along with being loved by God as if they're together in unison. He says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says it in Ephesians 1. And and, and he says it over and over. But let me read Ephesians 1 to you. He says this, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, and love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through, G- through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So listen, there is this theme throughout Scripture that we see over and over again where God chooses his people. And that's a hard thing for us to process. Many of us struggle with this idea for lots of reasons. And it causes Churches to split over and over. And, and, and we throw out terms like heretic and, and charlatan because when someone says this, it, it, it goes against everything I've been taught and understood when it comes to Scripture. And so I want to know, is this a biblical truth? And the answer is yes. But here's the other question. Why do we have a problem with this so much? I think there's two main reasons. I think the first one is this, is that the thought is that if we are chosen by God, then, 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 then we're just robots and that we're his by default, right? And that we have no choice. So what's the point? That's, I've heard that a lot. Like, and that, that's, we struggle with that. The second point is this, is, and this is the, the biggest one, is that if God chooses certain people, to be his children, does that mean that he is inevitably choosing other people to go to hell? That, that doesn't sound like a God of love, Colby. And these are supposed to be points that we hold on to. This is supposed to be the things that we dig our heels into when life gets hard to remind ourselves about how God is good and how he cares for us. And you're telling me that this God who chose me chose others not to be his? That doesn't seem very right and very fair. And so I want to address it. Because it's important to talk about it. So let's do one by one. The biggest one. The one that we just talked about. If God chooses people to be his children, does that mean he's choosing to send people to hell? So let's step out of that and let's step over here. Okay? Pause. If what the Bible says about sin is true, then that means this. Every person who sins, whether it the greatest sin you could ever imagine or the smallest sin that you could think of, if what the Bible says about sin is true, then we all who have sinned will face death, destruction, and punishment from God. And rightfully so. To sin is to reject the things that God has said for us. It is the creature telling the creator, I know better than you. And I'm going to spit in your face when I do what I want because my way is better than yours. And the Bible says that God justifiably has the right to punish us for our sins. And the truth is this, is that as much as we don't like that, the the punishment that we receive is eternal separation and damnation from God forever. That's the place that we call hell. And so if every person who has sinned is is, is justifiably going to receive that, that means that we're all destined for hell. Yet the Bible says that God steps in And he saves some. He saves people by Jesus' death on the cross. When we choose to sin, that's our responsibility. And every person that chooses to sin is destined to hell without the interference of God in our lives. God has no reason and doesn't have to interfere with our 
with our sin and what we're doing because he's God. He doesn't have to. And so the question then should not be, why does God send some to hell? The, the better question would be, why does God save any at all? If everything that we do is driven by our desires, if we sin one time by our desires that go in direct opposition of what God has taught, God has no reason He's not obligated to save us and forgive us. He's not. What right do I, as a creature, have to tell the creator how things ought to be? Right? Like when our children come to us and go, look, mom, daddy, here's how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's what you know. You're going to give me $100 a week. I want that new iPhone. And I'm not going to have any, any phone limits on that phone. Okay? I'm going to have it all night. I'm going to get to go where I want and do what I want. And as long as you say yes... I'll be nice to you. <laughs> Sometimes I'll come home and eat dinner with you. We'll see how it goes. And maybe, just maybe, when I, when I uh, you know, feel like it, I'll throw up a couple pictures of you on my social media just to let people know how much I love you. <laughs> right? Y'all laughing because you know how dumb that is. But that's how we are with God all the time. Look, I'll give you props and I'll give you praise as long as you give me what I need and what I want. And that's how we treat God. What right do we have? as the creature, to tell the creator how it's going to be. We don't. And so the thing that we need to remember is that God is good, and he has loved us from before we were created. And before we were created, God chose to save, period. He doesn't have to, yet he chose to. And that's what makes God so great, is that he has no obligation, no right to do anything that we want, yet he chooses to. Second thing that we need to talk about is this idea of choice. Don't I have a choice? I mean, I chose to trust in Jesus, right? I chose to see uh, that God is good and that Jesus is my eternal Savior. So you're telling me that I had no choice in the matter? Well, let, let's talk about that for a second. The, the, the thing that we need to pay attention to is this. Sometimes in our, in our minds, we, we have a hard time recognizing what is being said about God in the Scriptures. So let's talk about this. When the Bible says that God, from the beginning, chose to intervene in our lives and save us, that doesn't mean that you and I don't make choices. Like some of you woke up today and you chose to have one cup of coffee instead of two. It's good for you, right? You're not as jittery as I am, right? Some of you chose to leave your kids at home because it wasn't worth the fight. You know what I mean? Like, nope. Okay. We choose all the time. But when it comes to salvation, the Bible says that this, that God chose to intervene in our lives long before we made the decision to trust in Christ. And so while you may have said, yes, Jesus, I'm choosing to believe that you are God and I'm choosing to follow you and give you my life, long before that, God intervened in our life and he pointed us towards people and places that helped us hear the gospel to see the reality of our sin and that there is a Savior. Listen, when we talk about our choices and our free will and all these things. The Bible says that outside of any interference of God, we will always choose what makes us happy, what makes us feel good. It's called selfishness. When we talk about this idea of making choices and free will, it's always generated out of this desire to have my ability to do what I want and I'm not letting go. And what I tell people that is this, is that, yeah, you have the right to make any choices you want. You do it all the time. But outside of any interference of God, you will always choose sin, which will always lead you to hell. And Paul says that in the scriptures over and over again, that no man seeks after God, not one, nobody. Every man seeks after his own way. But because God is good and because he loves, he interferes, he intervenes, he puts us in places where people share the gospel with us. He puts you in families with grandmothers that pray for you. He puts you in friend circles that love you in the midst of your mess to invite you to church. He puts you in jobs where your boss may not be the best boss in the world, but a coworker loves Jesus and takes you to lunch. He puts us in places where we hear the gospel, where we have the desire to learn. He puts that in us. And there's a reason that's important because Paul says that God is the author and the perfecter of our faith, meaning he's the one that starts faith inside of us. So you make a choice to follow Jesus, but he's the one that put that in you. 
And there's a reason why that's important. Because as we grow in our faith, as we begin to find life get difficult, or we find ourselves further away from God than we want to be, we, we, we can go back to this truth that God loves us and he chose us. And no matter how far we run from him, we're still his. Now, I was talking to my son about this the other day. Sometimes in our life, in our, in our faith, like we've, we have these dry spells where you know, we initially like really like grew in our faith and, and we love Jesus. And then like weeks, months go by, sometimes years where we just don't feel really close to God. We believe Jesus is God and we understand the truths of the scripture, but we just have a hard time like feeling close to them. And I, and I, I try to communicate this in a way that makes sense. Like, like my children are my children from the day they were born. They're always going to be mine. And there will be times when I don't hear from them and I won't see them, but they're still my children. We may get into a fight. And I want to punch him in the face. I might. Like I've told my son, we're going to fight in the yard one day. It's going to happen. Like, it's a rite of passage for sons and fathers. You know it is. But I'm still going to love him. And this is the reality with us and God. There will be moments in our faith where we feel distant from God. I've been there. I can look back and see times where I was far from the Lord. And then I can also see God using people in situations, sometimes sermons, Sometimes things that people said that slowly pulled my mind back to the reality of who Jesus is in my life and showed me that I've always been his child. Even when I tried to run, I've been his child. The, the cool thing about God is this, is that you and I understand this, that if you have believed, God has chosen you to be his child. How do we know who these people are? We don't. The only way that we're going to know who these people are is this, have they believed in Jesus? Look, it's not my job or my responsibility to go around and start looking at people and going, uh-huh, you're, you're going to be saved, but not you, okay? You've been chosen, nah, maybe. We'll come back to you, right? That's not our job. I don't know who God has chosen to be his children. But I can tell you this, it's my job to go and tell every person I can and let him sort that out. And why is this good news? Because you're his forever. And as God holds on to you, we can hold on to this truth that he loves you and he wants you to be his child. And from before you were born, he already mapped it out that you would be his. That's a truth that we can hold on to. And that's a difficult truth to talk about that we don't want to hear in the church because it's, it's, it confuses us. And, and many of you are going to walk out here today and go, I don't know if I can go back to that church. You might. I don't know if I can go to a church where they teach that. Well, let's have coffee and let's talk about it. That's a deep truth that's hard for people to, I would challenge you, open up the scriptures and look. See where throughout the scriptures where we see from the beginning, beginning God choosing people to be his. And I can tell you this, that as hard as that is to swallow, I want you to remember this, that there's no reason God chose you other than this, that he loves you. You and I are not worth being called his children on our own. The only reason why we're made worthy is because of Jesus. That's it. So there's two truths that we hold on to. The third one is this, that God is working out our sanctification. What does that mean? God is working out our sanctification. It means this, that God is making us like Jesus. Sometimes when we hear that phrase, that God is working out our sanctification, we think that it means that we're um, becoming perfect. And the truth is that's yeah, that is, but you're not going to be made perfect until Jesus returns. But what we can see is this, is that God is actively making us like Jesus. So how is this done? Paul says it's done by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the belief in the truth that we find in scriptures. So how do we believe the truth? Well, number one, the Holy Spirit enlightens us on what is true and what isn't. You know, we've talked about this before. Avoid these teachers that come in and teach things that are opposite of what, what the Apostle Paul and what Jesus has said. There's people that are going to come in. It's going to sound like the truth, but it's not. So how do we, how do we decide what is true and what is not? That's why we, we learn why we believe what we believe, and we stick close to the church. Because when we're out riding solo and trying to do our faith on our own, it's easy to be, to be you know, deceived by somebody that's teaching something that sounds like truth but isn't. But the cool thing is this, is that the Holy Spirit enlightens us on what is true and what isn't. He says, you've received the spirit of the world. He says this in 2 Corinthians. But the spirit who comes from God 
so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God, because it is foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by, by anyone. What is Paul saying? He's saying this, that those who are, are believers in Christ have received the Holy Spirit, and because of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are enlightened to the truths that God has for us, and those who are not in Christ won't be. I mean, isn't it comforting knowing that not only God loves you and that he has chosen to save you, but he has given you his spirit to help you know what is right and what is wrong and to help you do what is right so that you can honor him and avoid sin. Look, I'll be honest with you. Like the, the longer I follow Jesus, I, 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 I thought that it would be easier to follow Jesus. Like get through the difficult stuff and then get in this kind of coast, Right? But I, the longer I follow Jesus, the harder it is for me to follow Jesus. Maybe that's just me. And I'm, there are days whenever I wake up and I look at my life and I go, I don't feel like I look any more like Jesus now than I did years ago. In fact, I feel like I look like Jesus less. I mean, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm trying to avoid the things that I should avoid and do the things that I should do. But I have to remind myself over and over again that it's a work of the Holy Spirit in my life. He's the one making me like Jesus, not my effort and my ability and all the good things I do. And so whenever there comes a point when you find yourself just kind of going, man, I don't know if I'm doing this whole like Christianity thing right. Isn't it comforting to know that the Holy Spirit is in your life and he's actively helping you see what it's like to just not just follow Jesus, but become like Jesus? So these are three things that Paul tells us that we can hold on to. And the last one is this, is that there is a future glory that God has for us. Listen, if these things that we've talked about don't encourage you, I want you to remember this, that God saved you and he's making you like Jesus for a purpose. He's making you perfect for a purpose. And you want to know what that is? It's so that you can get Jesus forever. Like we, we have to understand that's the end goal. I think we have painted a picture of heaven that is so great that often we make heaven look better than Jesus. I know that seems crazy, but think about it. For years we have taught, man, if you don't get Jesus, you're going to hell. Don't you want to go to heaven where the streets are gold and you get a mansion and it's crystal sea, right? And I remember as a youth pastor, uh, when I was a youth, my youth pastor would be like, man, imagine heaven like, like your heaven, like, like chocolate milk swimming pools and stuff. And I'd be like, what? Like, that's weird. Like, we're trying to make like heaven custom to us so we can go, oh, I want that. But Paul says in verse 14 that the whole purpose of, of you, you getting Jesus and holding on to your salvation and being sanctified by the Holy Spirit is so that you can get Jesus. He says, look, he called you to this through our gospel. Why? So that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like heaven is great because Jesus is there. That's where God dwells. And there will come a day whenever we get to spend eternity with God. And I don't care wherever that is, the goal and the end goal, the prize at the end of this life is not heaven, it's God. We get him. And that's the goal that we ought to set our minds on. So when everything is over here, the hardships and the, the letdowns, the disappointments, the struggles, everything that we hate to deal with, rejections and all that stuff, when it's all gone, the Bible says that we get Jesus. We get a new life. We get a new name. We get to spend forever with him where everything is as it should be. And for eternity, we worship him for who he is and what he's done. His goodness, his work, how he's made us all new. We get that. We get, we get a place where there's no suffering and there's no pain and there's no struggles. Nothing lets us down there. And we call it heaven. And knowing that, awaits us, ought to help us when life gets hard. We have these things to hold on to. And Paul says these are things that you need to have a firm grip on. 
when you're about to be pulled into the mud pit of all the struggles that's in front of you, he says, dig your heels in on these truths. Grab, like, grab tightly to these things as if, it, as if it's a rope that you don't want to let go of. And he says, not only does that help you with your struggles, but he says there's a purpose behind it. He said, there's a purpose behind it. He says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who's loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Look, we have taught that these are the things that we hold on to so that we can endure hardships. But Paul says, not only does it help you do that, but it helps you continue on doing the work that he's called you to. Did you know that that God has given you a task as a Christian. Every Christian has a job to do. Like it's not just to have kids and go to work. We have jobs as Christians, all of us, and that is to tell people about Jesus. And it's hard to do that in a, a culture that's against Jesus. And so I want you to, to remember that the work that Jesus has done for us these truths about God and how he loves us and how he's chosen us and how he's making us like him, how he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can become like him and how he's got a future glory waiting for us. These are the things that not only drive us to get up every day and keep going, but these are the things that we share with others. This is how people hear the gospel. So we have reasons to be thankful and hope, hopeful in the like worst situations of life. But we also have reasons to share the hope that we have with others. And these are here. And so the challenge for you today, man, I don't know. There's like, I've been racking my brain on what that is. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're like me, like you know these things to be true. And it, it it's just takes a while to set in and make sense. I, I would just, I would say this. I would ask you to go home today and, and ask the Lord to help you understand the truths that we've talked about. And ask the Lord to help you see where you're lacking in understanding and in an application. Because sometimes it's easy for us to get wrapped up in, I don't understand. And it causes us to stop following Christ. But the Holy Spirit's the one that helps us understand. And so I don't know what that looks like for you. I'm sure... Many of you are going to struggle with these things and I'll get phone calls and emails and I'm okay with that. Like, let's wrestle with these together. My challenge to you would be this. Don't run from the church. Don't run from Jesus. When things like this are, are hard to understand or when life is difficult and you've got these things in your hand, don't let go. Even though you don't fully understand, don't let go. Trust what God has done in your life and stick close to the church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you, God, that you love us that you've given us Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you will never leave us or forsake us. No matter how, how, how hard things are, no matter how confusing some of these things may be, Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that you love us. From before we were born, you loved us and that you're not gonna let us go. So thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Trust in